Ha! Is it hot where you are? It's hot where I am because I am smack dab in the hottest middle of Texas at the High Rith Hope and Healing Retreat, July 2023. Uh, it's hot here, my friends, but it is gorgeous. I love it. And we're having fun and we're healing and I can't recommend it enough. Uh, but I'm here at all because I'm part of a growing world of people who have experienced DNA surprises. So let me back up. Hi, starting over. Hi, I'm Eve Sturgis. This is a podcast called Everything's Relative. I'm here because I found out that the man who raised me isn't my biological father. And when I found that out, I actually found out that this kind of thing not only happens frequently, but it happens more and more frequently because of all the modern DNA testing we have um, access to these days. The way the internet allows us to research and contact people so easily is making this an exploding phenomenon. So it's those kind of DNA surprises I'm exploring with people. These discoveries are thrusting people into new realities of being adopted and no one told them, being donor conceived, no one told them, or like me, at least one parent, usually the dad, but not always, isn't actually the parent for myriad reasons. That's what this is all about. However, today is a little bit different, not only because I'm recording from Texas, but because the person I'm interviewing is Rebecca Autumn Sampson, and her role in our community isn't actually as someone who experienced a surprise. Um, not the way that I just described, anyway. Rebecca Autumn was adopted at birth, and she's always known. But what we are learning in the DNA discovery community is how much we have to learn from adoptees. Uh, adoptees have been walking this like existential identity journey for so much longer than us. You know, like an en, en masse as a group, they have been they have been learning and discussing and exploring this. There are lots of differences, but certainly a ton of similarities, and we're learning from them in in insurmountable ways. And that is why um, Higher Earth Hope and Healing is a group for DNA discoveries and adoptees. It's why I have featured adoptees on here before. Emma Stevens was on recently to talk about her book, The Gathering Place, for example. Um, right to Know, another organization, also includes adoptees within their network. So, like Emma, Rebecca Autumn comes from this community that has this great wealth of knowledge for us, and she's exploring the same themes. She made a film about it, a documentary called Reckoning with the Primal Wound. It's being talked about in all our spaces. It has been for a few years. High Earth Hope and Healing features a viewing of it every quarter. There's one coming up, in fact. Um, so if I don't mention it later, remind me to get the info up. Um, it was featured at the Untangling Our Roots Summit in Louisville, Kentucky in April. And I was lucky enough to attend the premiere earlier this year at the Catalina Film Festival. And I think this movie is important for everyone to see. It's for adoptees. It's for anyone who knows an adoptee. It's for adoptive parents. It's for people who are considering adoption for their own family or relinquishing a baby of their own for adoption. And it's for everyone in our community to learn a little about themselves, no matter where they land in the surprise spectrum, um, to learn about our brethren adoptees. And I got to talk to Rebecca Adam all about it. Listen to it with me now, and I'll meet you on the other side. This is Eve Sturgis, and this is Everything's Relative Podcast. Okay, so every time I point to you, you say something cool, okay? Hey, Dallas, do you want to make a podcast? Yeah, sure. Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters. And here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters. I, didn't, I don't know how it works. It's okay. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Cool. Can I? Can we set it up now? Yeah, and then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Awesome. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. 
With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Wow, I downloaded it right now. <laughs> Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, hmm, food tastes better, wine tastes sweeter, and I'm a better mother to Dallas. Isn't that true? Yep. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started. Okay. Oh my gosh. Woo. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and you won't believe it either because my computer keeps crashing. We're doing it. We're here. We're done. Look, like even if it ended right now, like we will have done it. Like we See? got it. We're on this. We're on at the same time. <laughs> take it to the bank it's already recording we got it we nailed it we're we're winning we're already winning don't worry about it if your computer crashes just call back in on your phone so all right all right rebecca autumn so i have you here today as an adoptee and as the director of the documentary film reckoning with the primal wound which is has been talked about a lot and it's sort of circulating and is kind of hot stuff like within within the DNA discovery adoptee community and so it's very thrilling I feel very proud to have you on here today to talk with me about it let's just start at the beginning um tell me about tell me about being an adoptee well first thanks for having me on and I'm a fangirl of yours I think you're the coolest. Um, oh, that question. No one's asked me that ever. What? Happy. What's it like to be an adoptee? <laughs> or like, what is like, so, okay, so. But I can do it. No, I, mean, I, I can break, I can break the shit down. Okay. No, okay. No, you I, do it. You do it. Like, <laughs> even today I had a, a meeting with somebody in the music industry and I just discovered they're an adoptee too. We've known each other for like a year and you know, like it, these. Yeah genealogical bewilderment conversations don't just pop up no they don't business talk or casual talk um but it's so nice when they do and then you're able you you're just on that level of understanding and we had that same conversation this morning of like just navigating things and people not understanding (sighs) it got kind of like emotional even as it does you know when you're mm-hmm. talking about all of this stuff um because it's so nice when somebody gets it and then talking about how you know like only well what is it 97.5 percent of the population is not adopted or dealing with this stuff i mean it might be different with npes like if you factor in all that what is it but it's still probably 90 percent of people but don't yeah. get it. And I think even though, even though there's so much overlap and, uh, and I talk about that a lot and we're learning so much in the adoptee community, you really are and have your own experiences of existence and development and identity. Sure. I think, I don't think they're exactly the same. And I have never thought about it like that. You just said 97% of the population is not adopted. That's a lot. Yeah, I just started thinking about that and talked about it at the Guam screening a couple months ago, because I think it makes the point. I guess I would have thought, I guess I just like clarify for for listeners, make sure they understand what is surprising about that is that I have always heard it put as three to four percent of the population is adopted. Right. And so that's a bit I would have said if you had said that to me, let's if I hadn't known that I would have said like, oh, that's a pretty good amount. We get into three to four percent and like that's almost half of 10 percent or something you know like i would just yeah. I, like it's that's five percent like that's like that's kind of that's a good chunk or something and i would have thought but when you word it as 97 percent is not adopted right it sounds a lot smaller which i also just got that and thought hey that's the way i'm gonna say it from now on because mm-hmm. the gravity of it hits in a different way where maybe people will be like oh well, 
they are like marginalized and misunderstood. And uh, there's something here that needs to be addressed. And highlights how special it is when you do connect with a fellow adoptee like you did today. Oh, yes. That point. That of like, it is a needle in a haystack almost. And so nice and refreshing. We literally had that conversation today. And I realized how I really don't have that conversation in the music industry or, you know, outside of this community. I never get to talk about it or just be myself. And if we're talking about identity, then I think that is so helpful to be able to have those conversations with people outside of the community that really get it. Because this person's not in the adoptee community. They should be, <laughs> but... Right. There's so many people out there that don't even know that there's these like subsets of of community or like of the world are out there, which I'm sure both of us were that person. Right. Was. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. hundred <laughs> percent. Not even that long ago. I've only been in the community for, I'd say, two and a half, three years. It was deep into the film. So how did you decide to make a film? What was that about? <laughs> That was um, literally my medium and I, me wanting to show the documentary to my brother and other members of my family that were struggling with addiction. And I was 100% sure someone had already done it because the book had been out since 93, super popular. And then um, I couldn't find anything. So I am a filmmaker and was pregnant at the time. And it was just one of those destiny moments where you're like, oh, crap, it's me. I have to do the <laughs> destiny moment where you say, oh, crap. Mm -hmm. I think just saying yes to things gives it more momentum and you kind of manifest things that way, you know? So I think that's what happened because of where I was in California and being so close to some real experts that said yes to like David Brzezinski and Nancy Berrier and Nico Opper. And then when you have three experts right there, you're, you got to keep going. Yeah. There's no going back. Once you have, <laughs> once you have Nancy Berrier saying she participate, you can't, there's no turning. There's no never minding that one. And that was all like, what is happening? Oh my gosh. And she's so sweet and um, was really fun to work with and appreciative. And so I get a lot of backlash about it being a tribute to her in the book now, but at the time, I never thought that was part of the space, you know, oh, huh. I would never have thought that that, like, but of course, there's like 18 corners of every part right. of a community. So I stand by Nancy deserving a tribute film. Yeah. Oh my goodness. If that's the only takeaway, then I don't think they're watching the same film. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so let's back it up, though. Let's back it up. Let's pretend that, that that there's listeners to not pretend. There probably really are listeners who have 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 no idea what this is. So what is Reckoning with the Primal Wound? How do you describe it? Well, so it is a film that is literally reckoning with the primal wound, both in theory, that concept and the cultural phenomenon of Nancy Berrier's book, The Primal Wound. So um, since my mom does push back on everything she wrote and doesn't believe in The Primal Wound. So it is, it's reckoning with all of that and how there are people that don't believe in it and um, just what it means to have one. Does it exist? And kind of like the book does with these little vignettes and anecdotes from adoptees so it's a lot of adoptees voices in the book the film does that too I wanted it to and so it's like maybe we haven't done scientific studies on separating babies from their mother or gestational carrier but if this many people are saying it and being like yes this is how I feel I think that holds a lot of water yeah Absolutely. So let's pretend someone doesn't know what the primal wound is. How do you describe the primal wound? People are like, what do you mean reckoning with the primal wound? Yes, good. Let's back it up to that. 
And it's what Nancy says. It's just the separation of a newborn baby with their mother. That separation being physical, but also spiritual and emotional and um, more than just like a physical baby that's a blank slate. Like she really investigated that and was able to observe that with her own children and was so drawn to it that she switched careers and got a master's in psychology and wrote about it because it was so drastic, (laughs) the difference in adopting and then having a child a year later. I didn't know that that's how that that happened for her. It's interesting. So for you as an adoptee, when did you become um when did when did you become introduced to that book or become familiar with that concept? It was interesting because I would meet adoptees throughout my life and they would ask me if I'd read The Primal Wound probably in my 20s and that happened 3 times over 10 years and I'd be like no, I don't know what you're talking about. And then it's finally like, what is going on? This must be a thing. And uh, so the third time I finally read it when I was 29 and it changed my life. Like so many people say in the film and then just out there, of course, it's life changing. And I immediately talked to Martha Carroll, my mom, about finding Jill. And that happened because of the book. So it totally changed my life. And we did meet then. Mm -hmm. Jill is your bio mom. Jill is my biological mother and she co-produced the film with me. So it's from both of our perspectives and a lot of her story in there. Yeah, there really is. That's really moving. That's a really moving part of it. So how much of your journey with Jill had happened before you started making the film? Half of it. Only half of it. And then the rest was... Because we started filming in 2017. We reconnected in 2012. Yeah, it was like, had been five years. So still, I mean, so much has happened now. And then I know I'm like still happening, right? Like I, people say that to all the make a movie with your <laughs> biological mother. You're really going to fast track all of the things and like growing closer and fighting more. <laughs> but yeah, that can, yeah. Oh, wow. Had to do a lot of validating and like, we're not going to leave each other through this process. So it's been a continuing thing, telling our stories, which I know you encourage people to do and have tools for them to be able to do that. But it, if you really want to grow, tell your story. That's <laughs> you really want to grow. <laughs> if you really want to grow, make a movie. <laughs> when you decided you wanted to make a film, what was the initial response from your adoptive family? They um, are used to me making films. So in documenting things, my dad actually bought me my first camera. So that was nice, Mm -hmm. but they would not be on it. So it was a lot of me chasing them around with a camera and they would just not. So I stopped trying to get them to do sit down interviews. But over the years, you know, my mom would, we'd have these conversations that I was like, that was so gold. Can I please record? And she'd be like, no. And then finally she was like, you can use my audio, just my voice. And so that is how a lot of that happened. And then my dad did two minutes of a sit down after years of asking this. It was, it reminded me of asking for a dog because I feel like it took the same (laughs) amount of time to say yes. Right. (laughs) So that's just kind of our MO, you know, Mm -hmm. it's going to take like, They're that amount of stubborn, but they're so insightful too. And I think a lot of other adoptive parents can relate. A lot of people can relate to their stance and how they think about things. But I used, I think 99% of my dad's interview in the film, like it's all in there. And um, then the same thing with Martha Carroll, like most, I, I don't know. I had to cut some of the things she said, but it's, not, it's still really good. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's why the film is being so well received because there's not really, I don't, 
villainize anybody. It's so powerful to have everybody involved. It's really, I think, to, to, to just be like, hey, let's talk about adoption. And here's all these different people. Yeah, so nobody's a villain. Here's these perspectives. And I'm trying to respect the role that everybody has in this space. And that's, I think, my role in the community is to be, and it's gotten me in a lot of trouble, you know, not being someone who picks sides or oh like, sure villainizes a certain group of people but i that's not who i am and that's, i can't do it so in that sense the movie is really like me my vibe mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and create these conversations and not like shut anybody down no matter what you know how they identify in this space their adoptive parent or a biological parent or a sibling i wanted to put the siblings in there and that was from coming home to self so it's not just the primal wound mm -hmm. don't know if you've read her second book mm -mm, mm -mm. i know it but i mean i know of it kind of more about the neurobiology and um does bring up siblings and stuff that i thought was really good Mm -hmm. so I tried to put some of that in there um, from that book too, but um, yeah, thanks for recognizing that. Like, I didn't want anyone to look bad, and I hope that comes through. I think that comes through. Nobody, I don't remember. I don't remember leaving with that feeling. Like, I, you know, like I, <laughs> um, so. So uh, upon uh, initial experience, if I watched it a million times and was really like thinking of these particular themes, I might pick some things out. But coming in, I came in without expectations and and left just totally moved by the, the conversation around ad adoption. That was what I was moved about. So um, and there are individual stories in there and there are um, people, are, you know, are, are various types of characters because that's what our world is made of, but I did, I don't, I can't remember those so much as I can about the just sort of powerful discussion about the primal wound. Um, for the record, that's, that was my experience. Great to hear. Tell me about wanting to make it for your brother. Tell me more about that. So, um, this is where that term struggle bus comes from. I just, you know, you want to do as much as you can to help family members. And since reading the book helped me so much with identity issues and just understanding. And I think it's better to know and figure out the truth, wouldn't you say, than making up things. I would agree with you there. <laughs> <laughs> right. I knew you would. Um, and that was a problem with not just, I mean, I, I think a lot of people do this they'll make up the worst case scenario, especially if they're adoptees and they don't know about their biological family. And then, you know, the coping mechanisms may not be the best things to do. So it was to a critical level. And um, it, I'm the type of person that I don't want to not try everything I can. Like I wouldn't be able to live with myself if like something bad happened and I hadn't tried, you know, to make a film. <laughs> I was just about to say, so you went with making a film, which takes years. I know. Okay. <laughs> but I felt really pulled to that being a contribution that I could do. Like, it was just, I was like, I can, I'll do it. I'm sure no one will care or, you know. And I thought that was totally going to be the case because I didn't get a deal. Like the sales agents, they were like, yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants to hear about this. But then there is a home for it. And it does seem to be making some sort of headway. And my brother. That was like, and what about your brother? I see. Because usually in Q&As and stuff, I've had to be like, and he still hasn't seen it, but he has seen it, Eve. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, like three months ago. Oh, wow. Just saw it. Yeah. Wow. 
just now. And he is one of six children. And I think, I don't think his mom raised any of them, but he's reconnected with most of them. And he immediately thought to send it to one of them. Hmm. That happened, but I thought that was the best reaction. Probably fair to mention now, just in case anybody listening doesn't, doesn't know as much about, um, some of the t- statistics about adoptees, children or babies that are, or I don't have to say, to specify their age, but adoptees grow up to be more than four, four times likely to ha- struggle with addiction. Yeah, I think it's four times more likely with all of these, like over yes. in prison and rehab facilities and also to die by suicide but if you're BIPOC or LGBTQ it's like six times more likely right so so for you to want to make something to try and reach your brother it's an incredibly like relevant topic within the the adoptee community anyway thanks for pointing that out that's and that's why we did the Guam screening or why they reached out because unfortunately that was the case just last year Ash did die by suicide as a teenager. And so his mom started this foundation, the Ashnafi Loan Foundation, to help address this. And so many people were there, like 100 people were there, and they didn't know that. They don't know that adoptees struggle more with suicidality and all these mental health issues and addiction way more than the, the general population. Yeah, well, no one's talking about it <laughs> except adoptees. Like you have to, it feels like you have to get, you still have to get the password like into the club to learn all this information. We're in a bubble and I totally forget that when I talk. To yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Like ad- adoption is still just a, a glitter, you know, I think, I think overall adoption is still just a glittery, glossy, beautiful thing is the image and the idea and people know what it looks like conceptually about adopting babies or bringing home children. But when it comes to like unpleasant or uncomfortable statistics about them as adults, that's just not, that doesn't fit into the narrative. So it's just not a part of our conversation. Did you see how Jen Matthews from Conversations About Adoption posted getting that email from an adoption agency? And it was one of those. And in it, it was like, we're so excited and want to talk about how we'll probably get like 10,000 more babies since the overturn of Roe v. Wade. (laughs) We want to talk about that on the podcast. And and it was like, oh, they said it. They're going to start saying it like in the press. (laughs) Like it's not a secret anymore. Wow. Uh, Yeah, that struck me. She just posted it like this week. (sighs) Wow. The thing that we thought was probably the case it is i mean that's Mm -hmm. a supply and demand thing absolutely absolutely and i i'm one of the ones um and in this guam screening somebody stood up and her job was to like pair expectant mothers with hopeful adoptive parents and asked me if that was okay and i'm like if you know all, if the mother knows all the information and still chooses not to parent, I think that that should always be on the table. Like we still have to let women decide these things, but it's super important to know all the information. And also, I don't think we need to completely sever ties anymore or even do the adoption thing. The more I think about it, the more I don't even think we should use that term. I feel like it makes animals and rehoming too like animals i think of pets always why are we using the same term for right how has the spca like um got a better marketing (laughs) like a better marketing machine than the human adoption community (laughs) something about it doesn't Mm -mm. feel right and why don't we just stop why don't we just do guardianship and just change right stop doing that bureaucratic process of severing 
the lineage and the <laughs> all the family history and the medical history. Let's just, you know, I think that would be more an abolitionist stance, but I also totally understand that there's always going to be a need for children and babies to be safe. And sometimes that is not within their family of origin. Um, so, but the adoptees are not okay. Right. <laughs> Let's talk to adult adoptees and then figure out why they're so not okay. Because something's broken here. And that's what reckoning with the primal wound is. And that's my mission. Right. And people are watching it everywhere. Where have you gone to be a part of viewings? Oh, I want to go more L.A. and Ithaca and Manhattan. And Guam. Uh, I wish I was at Guam. Oh, you weren't there. I was there. I was there. I stayed up all night to do my 5 a.m. Q&A. Oh, wow. Okay. And I fell asleep five minutes before <laughs> and somehow woke up to them being like, the filmmaker is here. And I was like, oh, Ooh. turn my camera on and stop drooling. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was so cool. Um, I loved that. But they are 14 hours ahead of me. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're the next in person that I'll be at is Nashville in August. And what's that event? It's called Operation Fog Lift, and I'm doing it with Liz DeBetta. Mm -hmm. Do you know her? Mm -mm. She did this award winning play called Unmothered, and as part of her thesis, and it deals with primal wing theory. And since the theater has a very small theater at the filming station, there's also a black box space that we can do a one woman play, which is only an hour. So content wise, I don't, I think it's good. You know, it's like two yeah. and a half hours. Um, and then that's we'll, doable. That's a double feature. That sounds like a great pair. Yeah, that sounds double, like a great pairing. A double feature of uh, primal wound theory. And yeah. then calling it like Operation Fog Lift, kind of to play off of the adoptee army terminology and if you want to bring people it's like a good intro into mm -hmm. maybe if you have no clue then let's just do this little intro to primal wound theory i don't know what that'll do to people but we'll have a talk back afterwards and then we'll do the party bus so it won't be totally bleak it'll be fun and like a community building experience is what i'm hoping and there will be live music it we're doing two days, so it's Saturday and Sunday. And um, that sounds amazing. Mary Gaucher is actually going to be there on Saturday, which I haven't really told oh, anyone. Well, <laughs> but it's it official, here. so you, I can't. You, you, you heard it here first, folks. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like it's interesting. You said it, I don't want it to be too bleak or I hope it doesn't sound too bleak. I mean, it's it's the the whole the whole the whole. The mission is to invite people to understand all the aspects of adoption, right? And to look beyond and behind the glossy surface. And like all things, there is going to be a dark side. But there's but that doesn't take away from the community from community mm -hmm. and the opportunity to have fun and celebrate. Who you are too okay that's a great way to put it <laughs> thank you <laughs> i think i get discouraged because especially this week i've heard from other adoptees who a lot of people watched it this week it's having a mm -hmm. moment because other people are sharing it that aren't me and people like that better i think <laughs> as anything and you know if you hear it from somebody else it's better mm -hmm. than the filmmaker. and so that finally happened um Liz Speed, shout out in the UK, has been just sharing it. Everywhere. Oh, cool. Okay. And all these groups I'm not in, but like 10,000 member UK adoptee groups. And so people are watching it this week. And then they're trying to get their family members to watch it or their friends. And then the response is, mm, no, don't want to. <laughs> and so oh. that's, I think, where that insecurity of it mm -hmm. being bleak is coming from but there's nothing i once people do watch it they realize that 
this person they're connected to and have been throughout life might be misunderstood. And there's a, like, you could be closer to this person if you tried. And that's amazing. Like that outcome in developing relationships further, it's like leveling up relationships between so many different people, even if it's just friends that are apologizing or like didn't, or something's clicking. And so with Liz's play too, I think it brings out that emotional level that allows people to be able to get it, Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is why it's going to be a good pairing. And I love the arts. So if there's anyone with a inkling of wanting to know more about adoptees or NPEs or literally donor conceived anybody with the assisted reproduction. That's so many people. So many people. Surrogacy born people, people who are using a surrogate. Like anyone, which is my favorite quote. Everyone should see this film because everyone knows somebody. Yeah, absolutely. One of those like five categories. Do you think that people, people, uh, these friends or family of these people are resistant to seeing it because they're afraid it's going to um, scold them or shame them or make them just feel so depressed about adoption? It must, don't you think? That's, uh, yeah, that's what I think. It doesn't do that for for the record. It's, (laughs) I think we said that in the beginning, but yeah, it's not, it's very accessible um, tool. Thank to, you. To talk about this conversation. It's not, um, I, I would hope that, I mean, I can't speak for anybody else, I guess, but it's not a film that scolds. Okay, great. I don't think so, but the title it's mm-hmm. interesting. Oh, I yeah. had a, a lawyer also wanting to pitch it. He does like family law stuff. And he's like, it's gotta be shown at these law, like family planning, like family court conferences this that I didn't even know existed and somebody like googled it and was like it's anti-adoption just from the title oh interesting but in that space when you were bringing up legalities it's either or right right well the law doesn't allow for nuanced complexities (laughs) the law wants to be uh black or white exactly so that makes sense that that is what they would see from the title. Hopefully it'll just keep creating conversations. And if people are pitching it to be at conferences, that's amazing. <laughs> it doesn't actually have to be there. I um, also introduced this lawyer to Jack um, because they're like in the same region and his story is, I'm glad he's like more in the space now, but he hadn't heard of the primal wound until seeing the film. And I've gotten that from so many people. And Nancy doesn't believe me. She's like, everyone knows about the book. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, they so, don't. <laughs> so many people, even adoptees, because I'm talking about yeah, people who yeah. have one, <laughs> like, right, <laughs> um, that don't know about it. So, of course, like the general population isn't really going to know. So that is all I thought the film would be is just like a mm-hmm. small little dose of like, this is a thing. Right. Right. But you've got, there's this like grassroots movement where it is slowly growing and growing and growing. That's yeah. very, that's very exciting. It is. And I'm just wanting to amplify people like you who are doing the same work. And we all want that same outcome to like help people. Right. Right. And prevent pain and suffering. Yeah. Is that so much to ask? That's all we want. There's so many resources out there that like, it's doable. It's doable. Were there any surprises that you encountered while making the film? Um, or what was the biggest surprise of the film of the process? I think that I, I knew that I was kind of the stand-in pregnant person when I was filming and would film myself, but a lot of times not even my face because 
for most of it, I wasn't going to be in it. Like my story wasn't it. It was Jill, I thought was always going to be in it. And Doris, like that happened naturally too. And that was so compelling. And that was like easy, but it was surprising for my mentor and other producers to push me to tell my story about the box so much mm -hmm. and, um, because I'm behind the cameras usually and thinking about like the story arc as not as one of the subjects. So that was surprising. And I think I learned a lot about myself um, and would be drawn to do confessional videos, which I never do. <laughs> so now I kind of do that and think about how helpful that is. And anyone can do that. You know, when you're struck by something, you can film yourself in the moment having that, like talking to yourself and getting emotional. You don't have to use it in a movie or anything, but I right. think <laughs> when you do that and watch it back, there's something. It's extreme. Yeah. I mean, it's such a, it, we're in, a, we're actually, yeah, we are in a time in history for the first time in history. Almost everybody has instant access to filming themselves in a way that no one ever has before. Start documenting emotional experiences, people. Just see what happens. And that was surprising because I you can't really know that until it's starting to happen. And um, I think that's helped me immensely. Is there anything about the film that I sh that all the interviewers ask you that I have not asked you that you like? Have I forgotten something? And that's a serious question. <laughs> I just feel like. <laughs> I'm always waiting for someone to be like, you never even asked me the name of my film or something like something. I know. Like <laughs> or somebody be like, I don't know. Do you want to talk about? Um, but something that I get in Q and A's mm -hmm. is about my biological father and like what this. Cause he's not in the film. He's not featured in the film. He's not, he was, it was sort of lightly touched on in the director's cut that I put out mother's day 21. But then the movie was like two hours long. <laughs> right. So yeah. it was like, let's focus on the primal wound. That's very like feminine energy and not even go there because it's another movie. Mm -hmm. So that's another movie. I kind of lightly started. Doing oh, something. wow. Like you literally are working on another movie that focuses on biological father. Yes. Biological fathers and that relationship. Uh, yeah. I was going to ask you what's next. You know, if they're, and I hate, I, you know what I hate about the question, what's next is it sort of suggests there ought to be something, you know, <laughs> like there's a lot of talk. I don't know if this happens in the music industry, probably, but that's such a thing in Hollywood to say like, so what's next? What are you working on? What's coming? You know? And it's like, I don't know, like, maybe I just want to like live my life. <laughs> yeah, but no, I've got stuff cooking. I, should I talk about like, so definitely the daddy doc <laughs> mm -hmm. yes let's call it that <laughs> why did I say that I immediately daddy dog. <laughs> yeah like in my head it's called daddy issues but that's started and DNA angels shout out they gave me a DNA kit so we did confirm that who Jill told me it is is who it is and uh I've got a half brother out there on ancestry that just needs to log in again. <laughs> Are you out there? Are you a male? Do you have an ancestry account? Please log in. That narrows it down. Um, how do you not logged in since last October? Come on, bro. <laughs> log in. But if that works, that'll do it. Yeah, no. I got you. I got you, Rebecca. Adam. Don't worry about it. <laughs> You're in the film now. We handled it. This is being recorded, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. But I'm also like excited about telling more adoptee stories and kind of the first one I'm starting with. And if there's any directors out there that want to hear me pitch uh, the Garrett Morosky story in depth. What's that story? Oh, it's a story. And I have a pitch deck that's almost done. But Garrett from F-Boy Island, if anyone oh. was like, what? <laughs> in his story after watching that that is kind of a passion project that we're cooking <laughs> all right 
I mean, what do you think? Are you curious to know more? Totally. I mean, you had me at F Boy Island. You'd watch it. Okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, I got, I got lots of people that are into looking at pitches. So really? Oh yeah, <laughs> totally. It's so juicy. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. totally. I know a lot. I don't know. No, I, I, in all sincere, all sincerity, I love hooking people up with that stuff. So, oh my yeah, gosh, let me know. Yes. And they'll either look at it and be like, and either say, this isn't for me, but send it this way. Or they'll be like, or, oh, or it is for, you know, stage I'm at. And Garrett was at the premiere too. I don't know if you got to meet him. Um, was he that because you said F boy Island, I can only assume he was the good looking blonde one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, he had F boy Island written all over him. He was a very good looking man. <laughs> you saw him. Yeah. Yeah. Clock. Yeah. <laughs> like, really hey. tall. Yep. Yeah. The hot one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he's got a great personality. He does. That's the thing. It's like, I feel like in LA, I don't know, in the reality world, people can play vapid, but then it's, that's another surprising thing. It's like, he's right. so nice. And it, I don't know, there's something that should be, there's a story there that needs to be told. Somebody talk to me about them because I've got it. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> cool. Um, it's interesting, you know, I mean, we are <clears throat> we are digressing a little bit to talk about reality, but shows, but does everybody know now that, that these shows are like manufactured? And so when Rebecca Autumn says that someone can play vapid or be vapid, they're also, you know, that's like a choice by the producers and they're also editing things to be that way. So, so no one really, really knows who these people are. Um, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So I'm saying give Garrett a, a, another chance if you've written him off because of the Oh, I else. never wrote him off. <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> never wrote him off. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's work together. Okay, so wait. So this is an important thing we should cover, though. If anybody listening to this right now, they want to know more about Reckoning with the Primal Wound, a film by Rebecca Autumn Sampson, where do they go find it? What's the best way to see it? It should be really easy on the website now. I've gone around with the UX, the user experience, and now it should just be smash that watch button. It'll take you to Vimeo. You do have to log in if you haven't logged in to Vimeo before, but it's easy. And it's $9.99 for a seven-day rental right now. Um, maybe even I'll do a promo code for listeners. Whoa, I'll let you all know. Yeah, I'm like, I don't get that sounds so fun. Yeah, right. <laughs> a promo code. Fun. Yeah, we'll do that <laughs> just for the exclusive this podcast listeners. Great. What's the promo code? Do you have to come up with it and then tell me later and then I'll post it? You come up with it. I think it should just be everything's relative. Everything's relative. One word. So it's gonna be everything's relative for a 20% off promo code to watch the film. Amazing. You can also subscribe for $3.99 a month if you want to help support me and get like juicy content like the super salty Sundays where I vent about haters. <laughs> and oh, cool. there's a commentary track with me and Jill that's available to subscribers only. Cool. That also comes with a seven day free trial. And I'm also telling subscribers on Vimeo and on Patreon about things like Nashville. So if you're one of those, you can buy tickets before everybody else. That's so great. This is so fun. And what is the website? Reckoningwiththeprimalwound.com. Easy enough. And I will have everything linked on my website. I will have everything up on uh, the social media when this episode comes out. And I, I always say this to people, but if all of this sounds too confusing, just contact me and I will take you to the right place. Same with me. Yeah. Because I'm all over the place. I think I always respond. If I don't, just follow up with me. I emailed someone back last night who wrote to me in April, and I felt so bad that it took me this long. And slightly proud that I found the email. <laughs> it was like, oh, no. Whoa. It's so, it is. It's like a lot of communication mishaps, I think, is because there's so much of it going on, especially with the pandemic. And that was just all, it's like, a, we need to like all go on vacation. Mm hmm it's so hard. There are so many moving pieces. There are. 
what, between the two of us, people can find answers. Yes, we will get them to that film. We will get them to Reckoning with the Primal Wound, the film by Rebecca Autumn Sanson, on her website or through my website. This was so fun. I'm so glad we finally got to connect. Me too. And I think it was good timing at the end of the day. Yeah. Oh, good. Great. So thank you for having me. One of my favorite people. But pleasure was all mine. This was so fun. Um, and of course, like I'll be in touch about when it will be on and I will edit it and make it sound like we are just really well eloquent practiced interview partners. Important news, everyone. If you are in the Southern California area and you want to see Reckoning the Primal Wound on the big screen, Rebecca Autumn has just informed me there is a new screening happening July 29th. That is eight days away from today, the day I post this podcast, in Costa Mesa um, in Southern California. Beth Syverson, host of another great podcast called Unraveling Adoption, she's going to host a screening of it at her church. So I think I'm going to head over there July 29th, meet up with Rebecca Autumn and some other adoptees and other wonderful people in our community. Uh, And I hope that you consider coming. Come join us. And of course, if you're not in the Southern California region, so that doesn't make any sense for you, but you are in the Nashville area and it makes sense to head in that direction, get yourself to Operation Foglift uh, happening August 5th and 6th and go see it there along with the the show Unmothered. Thanks for being here with me, everybody. If you want to support my project, this podcast, there's a whole bunch of ways to do it. You can follow me on socials at Everything's Relative Podcast. Um, If you want info or links to more resources or just some cool t-shirts, head over to the website, everythingsrelativepodcast.com. And hey, if you have an extra 30 seconds in your life, please share the podcast, subscribe to the podcast, and leave a review for the podcast. That is how we stay alive out here in this hard, cold, hot, desert tundra of podcasting. I'll be back next week as we count down to the 100th episode. Woohoo! What are we even going to do? Uh, will it be a regular episode or will I do something new for it or special? And uh, by announcing that, I just put pressure on myself. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, myself. The only way to find out is to keep listening. And when you're not listening, I hope you're taking care of yourself spending time with your loved ones, and getting all of the root beer floats that you need this summer. I'm Eve Sturgis. This is Everything's Relative. Bye-bye. Everything's Relative with Eve Sturgis is produced by Eve Sturgis and Kaylin Egan and edited by Joy Rumel. Logo designed by Ivy McNally and music is used with permission from Goodbye the Band. Eve is a licensed psychotherapist, but her podcast episodes are not therapy sessions. All right. Have a fantastic night. You too. I keep thinking it's, I always interview people on Fridays. This is like off, off schedule. So I was just about to be like, have a great weekend. (laughs) I'll take it. (laughs) Have a great weekend in five days. Have a great week. You too. (laughs) Have a great week. It's only Monday. Okay.